Good morning. My name is Amy French and I'm the head of Level 39. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's virtual event, Diversity and Inclusion, Building Back Better. I am joined by leading entrepreneurs and investors to discuss one of the most pressing issues in, in the fintech space, diversity and inclusion. For many of us, 2020 has been a time for reflection. Businesses are now reassessing their plans, strategies, funding ambitions and products, but also their teams, values and commitments. This year, it became clear that we cannot build back better as a sector without tackling our shortcomings on representation and inclusion. A recent report from Extend Ventures, which analysed VC investment over the last decade in the UK, found that just 0.24% of the total sum invested has been received by black entrepreneurs, with just 0.02% going to black female entrepreneurs. That is just 10 individuals. The report also found that 43% of all funding from 2009 to 2019 went to teams with at least one member who attended an elite university such as Oxford, Cambridge, or Harvard. FinTech is no exception. In the UK, a mere 17% of FinTech companies have female founders, and women account for less than 30% of the sector's overall workforce, according to Innovate Finance. In addition, women receive just 3% of VC funding in the sector. Needless to say, the issue is stark. However, this year has seen a seismic shift in the way we speak about diversity and inclusion, and there is hope it is finally time for this issue to no longer be pushed down the agenda. Joining me today are three brilliant panelists who are at the forefront of this issue. I'd like to welcome to the virtual stage, Rosie Turner, co-founder and CEO at Inchorus and the FinTech for All Charter, Francis Dean, COO at VACT, and Saranga Chandratilaka, partner at Baldwin Capital and advisor to Diversity VC. Welcome to the stage or for joining us. Um, I'd like to hand over to each of you to, to give our audience a brief introduction of yourselves and your, your organizations. Rosie, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, yeah, wonderful to be here. Thank you very much um, for, for arranging this. And so, as you mentioned, I'm Rosie Turner. I'm um, one of the co-founders and co-CEOs of Inchorus. And Inchorus is essentially a technology company that is focused on improving workplace culture through um, smarter, smarter analytics um, and training. And through that work, actually, we've done a lot of work across uh, many sectors, um, particularly fintech, where we've worked on fintech for all, which is an industry-wide initiative, looking at how we can create a more inclusive fintech sector that will then attract um, greater diversity. We've done a lot of work, actually, with Level 39. Um, prior to that, I worked in corporate innovation for a while, um, attached to uh, Startup Bootcamp, the Accelerator Program, um, and, and then actually became very interested in the diversity and inclusion space, how potentially different technologies and innovations could, could accelerate the challenges that we were seeing. Um, and at that time, I became a partner in a tech for good consultancy called Friendly Fires, where I really built out the diversity and inclusion vertical and looked at a lot of the different um, technologies that uh, were, were available there. Wonderful. Thank you, Rosie. And Fran? Hi. Uh, I'm Frances Dean. I'm the COO of VAT. Um, so we are headquartered in, uh, in Level 39. Um, we are a, uh, a fintech company who are building post-trade processing um, platform for, for oil commodities. So, um, you know, we need to build a, a fantastic product for our customers and we can only do that um, with, a, uh, with a, a diverse and, and happy workforce. So um, for us, you know, diversity and inclusion uh, translates directly into, into the fantastic product that we have. Um, background wise, um, I'm afraid I come from evil oil. Um, so I spent uh, many years at, uh, at BP, um, mostly, uh, first of all, in corporate social responsibility, uh, and then moving into um, business change for software implementations, data management, that type of thing. Um, and then uh, a few years after that at Gazprom, um, uh, as a head of financial operations, and then briefly back to BP, where I got involved in in blockchain, uh, and that's how I I ended up uh, at that. Great, thank you, Francis and Saranga. 
Hi, I'm Saranga. Um, I'm a partner at Balderton Capital. We are a London-based uh, pan-European early stage venture capital firm. So we mainly invest at sort of series A stage in companies, uh, everything from deep tech all the way through to consumer technology companies, and obviously lots of fintech stuff in between, uh, both on the consumer side and the sort of back end side. Um, before I was a partner at the firm, um, I originally started as an engineer and spent a lot of time being a software engineer in various tech companies. Um, and then ended up being a founder and CEO of a company which I eventually took public. Um, so I've spent a long time in the technology industry in general, wearing different hats. Um, and then most recently, about three years ago, I started working with Diversity.vc when it started. Um, Diversity VC is a nonprofit organization that is committed to trying to improve the diversity in venture capital itself. Um, so we are less focused on the technology industry as a whole, but more on venture. Um, and you know, our, our sort of theory is that the lack of diversity at the VC level, at the investing level, um, propagates and kind of cascades down to a lack of diversity across the rest of the industry. Um, so we're trying to fix that bit first. Um, that's kind of what we're what, why I'm here today. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, it's wonderful to have you all here today. Uh, before we get started, uh, for those attending, um, if you would like to get involved in the conversation on Twitter, please do so using the hashtag level39. But you can also pose questions throughout the panel um, using the Q&A function to the right hand side of the platform and all questions will be answered uh, at the end of the panel in the Q&A segment. But let's get straight into the discussion. So historically, tech has lagged behind other sectors when it comes to diversity and inclusion initiatives. Why has that been the case? Um, Saranga, I'd like to come to you first, you know, to hear your thoughts, both as a, both as a tech entrepreneur and a tech investor. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you know, the the um, I think technology as an industry. So, you know, by tech, I'm going to sort of when I say tech, what I mean is sort of software or computer related tech. I guess just to be really, really definitional about this. But um, you know, tech um, started off being extremely technical in nature. A lot of the early innovations in technology, if you look at Silicon Valley's history and so on, were highly technical ones. And then, obviously, as technology has become more relevant and pervasive across the whole of everything that we do in our lives um, it's become it's become broader than that um, but that early starting meant that uh, the industry was really dominated by people who had studied technology at particularly university because that was the sort of level of of depth required to be able to really innovate within it um, and so it's about people who did electronic engineering people who did software uh, computer science and, and mathematics to an extent and subjects like that and in, in particularly the UK and the US and most of the other sort of Western, um, you know, developed nations, those uh, academic or those those subject areas have been dominated by men for a long time. Um, and I think that there was therefore a very natural um, sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, lack of diversity on the on the gender front immediately. And also a lack of diversity from a sort of socioeconomic or educational background perspective, because you were sort of see it was seen as being necessary to be highly educated. So that's why you end up with a focus of, you know, graduates from, like you said, Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, MIT, Harvard, Stanford, etc. Um, but, you know, the, the thing about this is that it's uh, in, in my opinion, it's 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 just a cultural thing, and it's a it's a stereotypic stereotyped thing. Um, and the reason I believe that is because if you look in you know a bit broader across the rest of the world, these biases don't necessarily exist everywhere. Um, you know, a really really good counterexample is India, where actually if you look at computer science or electronic engineering, it's basically 50-50 male female. Um, obviously very Indian, um, so not particularly diverse in that sense. But um, it just just shows that there is something in the way that you know we um, talk about these subjects and sort of select and self-select ourselves into what we do, which can lead into biases. And then they, of course, reinforce themselves because the second you start to do this, then you get this issue of you know those engineers who all look and sound the same because they're all from very similar backgrounds and very similar people start selecting other people like them when they're thinking of promotions or they're thinking of investing decisions or whatever else. And so you get this really, really bad cycle of, of sort of the, the initial thing being off, off kilter and then reinforcing itself. Um, and so we've got a lot of work to do, I think, to try and reset that balance because it's been going on for decades and that's not a trivial problem to solve, unfortunately. Absolutely. And, and this year has been unprecedented, obviously, with the global pandemic, which has obviously put a lot of tech firms into this survival mode. So through that has kind of diversity and inclusion initiatives have they taken a back seat has there been specific challenges to diversity and inclusion specifically during the pandemic um and perhaps rosie i'll come to you for that one sure um 
I mean, I think this year is definitely um, unprecedented. Is it's one of the words of the year, isn't it? Like, like you know, <laughs> definitely the case. I think in terms of has diversity and inclusion, where it's kind of sat on the the corporate agenda, for want of a better word, this year has been um, again a fairly unprecedented roller coaster. You know. COVID very much the beginning of the year and certainly we saw um, a lot of companies taking it you know off the agenda there was a kind of a refocusing um, in many ways understandably although obviously that it's a very flawed mentality and and I think there was some kind of external or higher um, signals there as well you know I, I we saw the government say okay fine no gender pay gap this year you know indicators like this that we're just saying we understand this doesn't need to be a priority right now um i think that uh, you know that's definitely then something that shifted massively towards the summer with the black lives matters and we saw you know again a complete repositioning of, of i guess yeah the corporate focus on this topic um from our perspective we definitely believe this is absolutely critical that it is high up the corporate agenda consistently and actually we would argue you know particularly um in these moments of uncertainty when there is the opportunity to kind of you know make really positive ground and what we definitely don't want to do is lose ground um i think in terms of keeping it up that agenda i often think and look at kind of what are some of those positive pressure points that we can see how, how do we take goodwill and nudge it into action because this is something that is typically a challenge within diversity and inclusion and i think there it really is looking at, at some of the, the kind of external pressures that can be put on companies so the likes of the government you know not cancelling gender pay gaps um it's looking to you know funds and vcs to continue to say no this really should be a priority at this time um but then there's also very much you know a grassroots pressure that can be applied so i think with black lives we really saw employees leaning in and saying actually you know that was not a sufficient response to this what are we going to do how can you know how can we go further to ensure that we are a you know anti-racist organization um, and the same for consumers putting pressure on there and saying, you know, that that wasn't sufficient. So all of those are, can definitely be really positive kind of pressure points. Um, I think something that we've really looked at a lot, this is um, in, within FinTech Rule, where we were really looking at how do we get the whole industry to become more inclusive here and, and kind of level up. And we certainly thought about it a lot in terms of that, that different pressure points. So again, how do we have industry bodies involved? How do we get the regulation involved? So the FCA now sits and is, is um, supporting the work. We then also looked at data. You know, how do we make sure that people feel that this is their problem, not someone else's problem when it comes to diversity and inclusion? So we've done a lot to bring um, data to the conversation around inclusion there. Um, and then finally, you know, somewhat cynically almost peer pressure is a massive one mm. when it comes to this topic. Um, you know, we've seen companies repeatedly want to make sure that they're they're doing the right thing and kind of almost keeping up with everyone else. And, and you can see that through a slightly negative lens, or you can say, okay, well, actually, this is a fantastic opportunity to make sure that we can push everyone forward together. Um, and again, that's something that we're really trying to do with uh, FinTech for All in, in terms of enabling everyone to take little steps forward together and kind of ensure that that's, that stays at the kind of collective agenda for the coming year. Absolutely. And if we think about kind of the bounce back from lockdown and the pandemic, how will strong diversity and inclusion initiatives help the tech sector and the UK more generally build back better? Fran, do you have any thoughts on that? So I think as as tragic, you know, as this um, this pandemic has been uh, for those who have, who have suffered uh, and, and for all of us, um, on the reverse, I think it's been a real uh, leveller in in some respects, and an opportunity um, in the corporate world to kind of advance um, uh, the diversity and inclusion uh, agenda. So, I mean, um, when I think about VACT in particular, we moved uh, extremely quickly to. Um, uh, realize a remote first working policy, something we'd been toying with mm -hmm. um, sort of on the edges of our consciousness prior uh, prior to the pandemic, um, was brought into kind of very sharp focus. And um, part of the decision making is that we agreed, you know, that a mix of people, some working remotely and others working in the office, meant that 
everyone was not equally disadvantaged. Um, and so we, we kind of made the decision it had to be one way or the other, at least for a period of time. Um, and, and obviously after the appropriate consultation, that's the way we've gone. And it is brought into <clears throat> hugely sharp focus, the challenges um, of, of people, you know, working at home with young p children, sharing cramped accommodation, um, sharing um, child minding, uh, observing uh, different uh, uh, holidays and, and vacation periods and really focused everybody, everybody on that need for uh, tolerance and, and acceptance. Um, so I, I feel like it's, it's a really powerful platform to build on your existing um, diversity and inclusion um, initiatives because actually it it kind of um, uh, takes away some of the blockers that may have been there before an ability to commute an ability to be located in a certain place um, you know family circumstances all of those things and of course we've had to reinforce reinforce kind of working practices you know making sure people stay even more connected and have access particularly to their leaders um, but I, yeah, I, I think that we've looked upon, and I hope that other corporates, um, not that we're a corporate, but <clears throat> are, are looking upon this as a, uh, you know, as a massive opportunity and and potential um, to leverage um, the, the the tragedy, unfortunately, uh, to to pursue that that agenda, you know. Um, more more avidly absolutely and you know i think for a lot of businesses there's been learnings like you've said as well learnings from a pandemic has put us in a situation that we could never have expected but a lot of people have taken opportunity from that and actually thrived in that as well which is really incredible to see um if we look at the the kind of difference between tech startups and industry giants do they face the same barriers when they are implementing diversity and inclusion initiatives if I come to you, Saranga, if you don't mind, I imagine you've kind of seen this from both sides. What's your opinion? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, of course, it's, it's definitely different for both both sides. I think, um, you know, the, the reality of tech startups, especially when they're in certain phases of their growth, is that they are, it's a very existential existence. You know, every day you have decisions to make and, and things can go, you know, I mean, you know, things can go wrong or right and, and they can sort of determine whether you survive or not. Um, I think obviously the larger a company gets, the more buffer you have around that. Um, and in that kind of very, very sort of, you know, fight every day uh, environment, it, it is super easy to um, lose sight of some of these bigger strategic things that you believe in. So, you know, most of the founders that we work with today, um, I mean, the, the really good news is, uh, you know, think about diversity and inclusion as being core to what they're trying to do about the kind of company they're trying to build. And, it, you know, th there are a few tiny exceptions, but. I think of most of the founders I've spoken with recently, I think this is so much more a topic that they are, um, you know, engaged with, that they understand, that they care about and everything else. So that that's great. Um, but then again, if you raise money and now you've got, you know, two months of, 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 of runway left and you're desperate to raise your next round and, you know, there are customers coming out of your ears and you've got problems with the product and so on and so forth. You know, you can you can get into the situation where you start to forget some of these sort of things that you 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 um, you kind of permitted to originally. Um, so. I think it can be hard for startups sometimes, therefore, to have this sort of consistent focus on areas like this. Um, but the interesting thing, again, I think about about um, sort of the COVID-19 situation is that it's demonstrated just how flexible we all really are and just how flexible organizations can be. Um, you know, we if, if, if I'd said to any of our CEOs, OK, from from, you know, if I'd said this last year, if I'd said, you know, from next week, you're going to work remote first. They, they, there'd be there'd be 50 reasons why that you know wasn't possible so quickly, and yet they all achieved exactly that at the end of you know February or March, depending on which country they were in. Um, and I think that's trained people into this idea of actually we can really change things. We just have to really force them through. We have to really believe that it has to happen. And if you can believe that it has to happen, um, then then you can you can make those changes. So I've seen. A lot of bravery actually around that kind of thing i mean diversity inclusion is just one of the areas actually i mean but you know people are sort of saying well yeah there's a whole bunch of things we always said we do um and we can do it so to give you another to give you an example from 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 our, our firm um 
you know, we've talked a lot about our impact on the environment um, because, you know, VCs travel constantly um, and we fly constantly. Um, and, and uh, you know, you sort of, if you, do, if you do the math on our carbon footprint, it's, it's horrifying. Um, and so we've talked a lot about that. And it's one of these things where we discuss it all the time, but we ultimately come back to, well, it's probably not possible. And you've got to do this in person. You've got to do that in person. And, and inevitably, we, we never quite get there. We never really, we, you know, we, we sort of look at it for a few weeks. We think about it, we get slightly depressed, and then we forget about it again. And it sort of happens every year. And I, I'm happy sharing this because I think it's probably, if people are honest, I think a lot of people go through this cycle. Um, but this year, we just stopped traveling. I haven't left my house in Cambridge pretty much for, you know, six months now. And I certainly haven't flown since March. Um, and, and yet, you know, it's worked. It's okay. Like, it hasn't been disastrous. There have been probably two, maybe three things where I think, I really, really would have been so much better if I'd been able to go and see that person in person and, and flown or taken a train to get there. But that's, that's you know, orders of magnitude fewer trips than I would have done in my old life. Um, so I think, I think realizing that it is possible is one of the big advantages. It, it, as Fran said, it's been this horrible tragedy and very, very difficult and set back so many people. But the one thing it has taught us, I think, is that we are much more flexible um, as individuals and as organizations than we think we are. Um, all you need, you know, you just need a big enough incentive to have to do, make the change. Um, so trying to sort of force, you know, trying to capture that and use that, I think, is a big part of what a lot of the startups that I know are trying to do right now. Brilliant. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for startups with corporates uh, and industry giants to really actually share best practice of what they've learned over the last eight months and how they'll uh, develop into 2021 and beyond. Um, but Rosie, if I come to you, because obviously the FinTech for All Charter was launched as a collective approach to to kind of tackle, you know, diversity and inclusion for the sector. How do you see both the charter and, and the work that you do to support smaller tech companies and the industry leaders to work together to create that inclusive space for all? Yeah, no, it's a, I think as, as you say, it's, there's huge opportunity to do that. Um, and it's something that we really wanted to, again, unlock because it just felt such a natural way to, yeah, share. I mean, I, I don't like the word best practice because I always feel like it shies away from action, but it is essentially to share learnings, to share failures, to um, to speed up ultimately that, that learning process. And I think it's definitely something that we have seen through doing this work is there's there's a huge challenge around sense making when it comes to diversity and inclusion. You know, we see time and time again the will is there the the kind of you know the 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 ambition to do the right thing but you know as um actually Saranga, as you say you know the the challenges of us being a smaller organization or a, or a fast scaling organization means that there is often you know a lack of kind of resource and know-how to to invest in really understanding the landscape understanding okay what makes sense for us to do next based on our unique size our unique challenges our, our journey um and so a lot of what we wanted to do is try and make that more accessible um to startups of all different sizes to say okay if you're here well a great next step could be this um and I think there is huge opportunity there to exactly as you say, kind of um, lean into collaboration between um, startups who are at different points of their journey. So um, as you say, FinTech for All, we have um, about close to kind of 50 signatories now, and they, they range drastically in size from kind of checkout.com and currency cloud down to um, to much smaller organizations who are you know just pushing their first kind of 20, 30 people, but want to be ahead of the curve in the way that they're thinking about this. And there, there is just endless opportunities to share and kind of open source policies, practices, interesting ways of, of, of communicating um, challenges to their organizations. Um, and people are often surprisingly, you know, willing to do that. You know, there, there is a sense that this, this definitely shouldn't be and isn't a competitive topic. It, you know, we, we will kind of collectively do our best work here when we, when we do share and I think, um, what we've discovered there is by playing that kind of middle role, you know, as fintech for all, um, there's been a real opportunity just to facilitate that because again, that's that's what it takes. It takes somebody to bring those players together and just create that space and facilitate it. And I think that's the role that we've seen within fintech for all is, is hugely powerful and that we can really help with. Um, and that yeah, we will be looking to do kind of more in, in different industries as a result. Well, I'm really here and glad to hear that fintech for all is is growing incredibly well with those signatories yeah. as well. Um, 
And if we look at those kind of policies and practices that, that you mentioned um, and look at, I guess, specific examples of diversity and inclusion initiatives that companies have implemented, um, perhaps, you know, Fran, are there examples of diversity and inclusion initiatives that either yourselves at VACT are working on or companies that you've um, experienced in the past? Absolutely. So, um, I mean, I, I, I kind of, <laughs> I feel badly that I referred to BP as evil oil, but, you know, <laughs> that's how people think of it. But, but actually, it was a privilege to kind of grow up uh, in that company, to be honest, because you were um, trained, you know, the, there was coaching provided constantly, uh, and diversity and inclusion obviously was, was was a, a an enormous topic and i feel like i learned so much there that i can now apply uh, in fact um so i think a really positive start for that was that there were you know two women on the executive committee almost immediately <laughs> um and the balance has been sort of 40 40 odd percent uh all the way through um you know and 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 weirdly uh a couple of New Zealanders out of nowhere. So how, how good is that? Um, yeah. And uh, I, I suppose my, my, um, my only, um, the thing that, that I personally like to, to coach people about in diversity and inclusion is that we tend always to look at the, um, you know, the things like um, uh, the obvious things, you know, religion, uh, ethnicity, those types of things, where I think it's also incredibly important to think about diversity of thought. Um, that that's that's to me that's that's critical. Yes, you want people who are different genders, uh, different races, uh, have different belief systems, but you also need the more experienced, the younger the introverts, the extroverts, the, you, you need that, that mix. Um, and, and, uh, I think mentoring is a hugely powerful tool. I, I learned uh, a lot of mentoring skills and, and I know that, uh, in fact, we're, we're starting to set up, um, you know, a, a senior, um, mentoring program. Um, and, and one of the big eye openers for me coming from corporate to a startup was that um, that young person thinking, I, I don't have it. <laughs> I just don't have it, but I want it. And so and so then you need to surround yourself with those young people who will think um, differently. Um, the other thing uh, at back, our first engineering partner was uh, a company called ThoughtWorks. I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, but, you know, they have an incredibly um, rich, uh, attitude to diversity and inclusion. Their recruitment of women in tech is phenomenal. I think it's something like 50%, which is almost unheard of uh, in the UK anyway. Um, and, you know, they, they to a degree, I think, kind of grew us up and, and showed us how to be a startup. Um, and the people we then employed had, you know, great role models also. Um, to follow. But I think our, our company culture is coming from a deep belief at the top of the organization, but it always has to be practiced. And I say practiced quite intentionally because you never get it right first time. And practice indicates that you're going to improve. You're going to make um, uh, different decisions. You're going to be braver. You're going to be better at recognizing, you know, uh, behaviors and, and calling them out. Um, so it, all initiative and all initiatives and any initiatives need to come from the top, but people also need to understand that they have and can, they have a personal responsibility and they can make a difference. So, you know, at the highest level, it needs to be in a strategic agenda. Um, uh, you know, there need to be these senior mentorship programs. Everybody has a role in treating everybody else with basic respect and decency um you know things like performance assessments you know at that uh i learned you know i learned this i i practiced this at bp and i i bought it to that in that you know if we do a performance 
uh, assessment or if when Saranga, you said you know you get an hour a year to talk about important things. I don't believe that that should be the case. There should be regular, regular conversation, quality conversation, and then you know if a performance assessment is made that's that that takes into account you know it shouldn't just be um you know tasks it should be the way that you are in the company and when we do those performance assessments the entire management team looks at the whole company and we're about we're almost 90 people i think now we look at everybody and we challenge each other so that there isn't um that we prevent <laughs> at least you know unconscious bias um so i mean equal pay and benefits are it's law right but it's also a moral obligation um i mean there's there's a million things i, I could go on and <laughs> um so i'll leave it there but th there's so much so much amy that can be done thank you fran and going on that point of unconscious bias um saranga i know at diversity vc you work with entrepreneurs uh, investors universities to create an industry that is free from unconscious bias how do you do that and what's the advice you're giving them yeah i mean well it's it's super hard um is the easy answer um and and so we we focus mainly on um investment and, and venture firms at diversity vc and um the the big unconscious bias sort of learning there is that, you know, it, it, I think so, so interestingly, because you're, because you're talking to people who are investors, they are, um, you know, kind of quite self fascinated about how they make decisions. So, you know, venture firms often talk a lot about what their decision making process looks like, and, and they obsess about this and they talk about it all the time and they compare notes with each other. It's a, it's, it's, you know, it's one of these things that people care about, you know, oh, this firm does it this way, we do it this way, you know, here's why we think our system is superior. And so actually approaching people like that and saying, have you thought that there may be this bias in the way you think about your investment decisions is relatively straightforward because they are all up for some more navel gazing around how they make investment decisions because that's kind of what they do. And they, they fancy themselves as being introspective on that kind of thing. And that's been easy. What's been really hard is convincing them that the same kind of training and the same kind of thought process needs to go through the other decisions they make. So, so convincing them that they've got to think this way when they think about making an investment is easy, but convincing them got to think that way when they think about hiring or when they think about promotions or when they think about you know how they you know how and where they build their firm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then then it suddenly becomes much much harder, and, and you get all the classic you know oh no we just hire the best people you know it just happens to be that. They all look exactly the same as each other um, and so on. And so and uh, so we, we've what we've done sort of tactically is approach on that investment end, because you know, we, 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 there's lots of fantastic research actually on investment decisions, because obviously it's a thing that, you know, you know, either loses, either, either creates or loses lots of value. And so you can start there and say, you know, looking at this research, looking at the data, we know that. Um, you know, more diverse teams make better decisions. That's, you know, accepted truth now in, in, in sort of academic financial circles. Um, if you look at, you know, why that's the case, it's, it's you know, a, a big part of why that's the case is because that diversity of perspective um, that sort of Fran was talking about before um, allows you to um, uh, look at every opportunity in, 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 in a more open way and, you know, not fall down the traps of your bias sort of affecting you and thinking something is overly negative or overly positive. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense to to measure yourself and see how good you are at this, and and be aware of it, and you know start to push, start to challenge yourself on it, and and we start there, and that's actually quite easy as a as a sort of entry point, and then what we try to do is sort of you know Trojan horse um, push that into okay, it's interesting, it's making your investment decisions better, maybe it would make your hiring decisions better, maybe it would make your you know mentoring decisions better, and so on, and you know there it's mixed right some firms um you know get get it and kind of really push for it and they this becomes a, a an important muscle of a thing that they train every every year um you know i'm definitely one of the people who believes that unconscious bias is not a thing you can ever remove it's something you just got to keep being aware of and keep working on and and some firms really do get that and start to do it others don't quite get there they'll do it on the investment side but they they struggle to take it beyond that um so you know that's that's what we're trying to do is take them through this path i it's it's one of these things where we, we know what I mean, I, I think it's clear what certainly I would like to happen. But but pragmatically, you have to start with where people are and then you have to sort of, you know, put, put them on a journey that hopefully gets them there over time. Um, someone mentioned it earlier, but you know, one of the other things that's worked really well for us and all of this is peer pressure. Um, so 
um, we, we recently, Diversity VC recently launched a uh, thing called Diversity Standard, uh, or the standard, and, and it's, you know, very, very detailed process. We, we went through it as a firm ourselves uh, in this kind of initial batch. And, and basically it means that, you know, if you go through it and if you, if you pass, you will get a grade and you can get sort of grades one, two or three. Um, so far, there are no grades two or three because no one is there, but there are a few grade ones now. And some people failed, right? Some people went through it and failed. And we don't, we don't publicize who failed. It's not, it's not about shaming people. But what's interesting is we've now got um, a whole batch of new firms that want to be measured too, because there is this sense of, hang on, other people are doing this. We're obviously missing something and therefore we should need to look at it too. And some of these things are, are, are tricks and nudges and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're sort of social um, tools that you're using. And, and in that sense, they're not as purist, I guess, as they could be. But you know what? It works because what it does is it sort of lets you have that first conversation. And then once you've had that first conversation, then people get engaged on it and they start to get on a journey. So that's sort of how we're trying to, to get people to sort of change their way of thinking in the, in the industry. But it isn't easy. Um, it's taking, you know, it's already, we've already spent three, four years doing this and, you know, we've barely begun, in my opinion. And you mentioned, you know, the, the kind of focus on, on research and data as well. And I'd like to, to come to Rosie on that point, because what is the importance of, of data when it comes to unconscious mm -hmm. bias, diversity and inclusion um tell us your thoughts on that um yeah i, I mean i i think it's of huge importance i'm a, a big believer in um you know what what's measured is managed and i think that's that's very true with uh, diversity you know we, we you know in terms of representation looking at who's there tracking that over time and looking to see improvements is is absolutely essential and i think it definitely plays a role in bias, you know, in mitigating bias as well, um, it is statistically um, more reliable than than just us making a decision process on our own if we have those numbers to kind of refer back to you and keep ourselves in check. Um, and I think that you know, if it comes, if when it comes to looking at data in diversity, we've got we need more, but we're getting better at tracking diversity data, looking for a kind of improvement there. Where I think we really are focusing is on looking at bringing that data to inclusion as well and thinking a bit about how can we really begin to help companies measure that and think about that in a way that lets them, again, see, see where there are the kind of biggest areas that need improvement and then also to then take targeted actions and then see whether that works. So um, it's, that's obviously much harder when it comes to inclusion. It's, it's typically quite a nebulous topic where it can feel like quite an abstract concept. I mean, what does inclusion actually mean? You know, we, we can all come up with a definition, but then how do we how do we measure it? How do we manage it? How do we track progress on it? Um, and so, you know, at Incorus and also with FinTech for All, that's really something that we've been looking at. And where we've landed there is, is that looking at these everyday behaviors, everyday actions, um, and really trying to capture those, like zooming in on the little data points, like, you know, when is someone made to feel um, that their idea is not valued, like valuable in a meeting? When is when is that slightly racist joke said and actually, you know, half the room winces? You know, when is someone kind of subtly communicated to you that, oh, actually, you're not gonna be able to do that because I don't believe that you're, you know, you've got the ability. And it's trying to kind of pinpoint those little moments and for us, capture that data and then begin to, to really look at the patterns and trends across that so that we can see, OK, this isn't just a case of, you know, in the tech industry, 70 percent of women feel like they don't belong. This is actually a case that you can see that these women of this demographic are experiencing these kinds of incidents where they're, you know, always um, spoken over in meetings or they're having to put up with sexist jokes. Um, and I think by really zooming in on that and looking at data there, what we hope is that we can, yeah, like I say, open the conversation around those particular areas, look at particular interventions that might be effective, and then track that data over time. Um, so I think I think it's critical, and, and it's also critical to giving the conversation the teeth it deserves. And it shouldn't be, in some ways. I, I kind of feel personally mm. quite, you know, we just know this is right, um, but you know, this is this is business, and this is how business functions work. And actually, if we can bring data to that conversation we empower teams organizations industries to to put it on the agenda to keep it up the agenda and to give it the kind of focus and resource it actually needs to, to move forward 
and on that point of kind of empowering employees um, and kind of creating an inclusive company culture, I mean, how do people that are working within these tech companies lobby their leaders to create a more inclusive environment? Um, Fran, is this something you've had experience with or have suggestions on how people can, can do that? So for me, people underestimate how much leaders like to be told what to do. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's ways and ways of, of telling them what to do. But I think they're a good leader anyway, is always listening. And um, in terms of uh, lobbying them for change, um, particularly in this, in this space, um, it's about relating it to the business. It's difficult to go to a leader with a set of feelings and this is why I'm so interested in what Rosie is saying in terms of the, you know, the the app and the the, the evidence and um, that that she is uh, helping to collect, because information is what people need. So all I would say to kind of people who want to to lobby their leaders for change is 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 go with the change you want to see, but also be part of it. So so don't go with just a vague feeling go with a, a, a solid suggestion of what you would like to see happen. Be prepared to be involved in it. You know, don't, don't kind of take it to a leader and say, here, this is your problem now. That, that never sits well. Um, and, and how then is it going to benefit the business? And I don't mean that that necessarily needs to be quantitative, but it definitely needs to be qualitative. Um, and uh, and the you know the the um, the stats the the analytics the information that's starting to be collected you know there's there's find a Rosie you know, find a Rosie and, and and get the information that you need and go with information um, but but don't be afraid and 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 don't be under any illusion that that leaders are not constantly looking for ways to respond to the peer pressure <laughs> that everybody's talked about. Um, so help them, help them respond. Brilliant, and those in the FinTech sector, sign up for FinTech for all via signatory. Um, I'm aware of the time, so just a final question, and I, I'm gonna come to Saranga on this one. So what is the role of stakeholders in the sector to move the needle on diversity and inclusion? And are the industry bodies, investors, and government setting the right examples? Yeah, I mean, I think I think they are really important. I think um, the uh, the the reality is, by and large, I'm I'm not all that enthralled by 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 what work has happened. I mean, you know, Rosie brought it up earlier, but the the the, the you know the, the the freezing of the the, the gender pay gap stuff this year was extremely disappointing. I mean, it doesn't really make any sense. It's not like this massive, complex, expensive process. So the fact that they chose to do that. I, you know, it, th that sort of thing is really undermining, frankly. Um, after really, I mean, it was it was very powerful last year. I thought, you know, I, mean, I think it really, really shook things up um, in lots of ways and made a lot of people think. So, um, so I, I do think they're very important. But I, I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of disappointed by by their by their progress so far. I think, generally speaking. Um, the really large um, stakeholders, the governments, the the, the large industry bodies, etc., have been quite slow moving. Which which is why you see um, you know the birth of lots of smaller you know newer organisations that are trying to agitate for that change. You know the venture capital industry has a number of industry bodies, none of which did anything around diversity inclusion for for years, um, and that's why Diversity VC exists. You know, Czech who founded Diversity VC is. A, is a founder GP at her, at her own VC fund. Like, you know, trust me, she doesn't want to do diversity VC if she can help it. It's this extra thing she has to do alongside her already busy day job. Um, and the second that the rest of the industry sort of took up, um, you know, this issue and, and really dealt with it properly and set the right trend, she would happily quit, I'm sure. Um, but, but she can't, she feels she can't because they're, they're not doing that. So I think it is really important. I think when it does happen, it can be incredibly powerful as we saw the gender pay gap. Um, reports last year but um when but you know the reality is it tends to move very slowly um what what i have found can work is these interesting catalysts that occur um societally you know i think in in venture a big one a few years ago was the me too um phenomenon um and particularly me too when it hit silicon valley didn't really hit sort of 
European venture or tech that hard, but it, it really did um, happen in, in Silicon Valley. And many of the people who work in this industry here, you know, are connected to people there. And, and, and that, that was a very powerful moment because it sort of brought this whole issue, the awareness of this whole issue up in, dr dramatically. And, and, and it's what then creates a bit of a wave around, okay, this is why we need to have you know, the Rose Report on female entrepreneurship. This is why we need to think about gender pay gap. This is why we need to think about diversity from a gender perspective, for example, in, in our industry. Um, and then this year, I think Black Lives Matter has had a similar impact. Um, again, nothing to do with, with tech, obviously, when it started. Um, and again, really n not even, you know, something that happened in this country originally, but, but nevertheless, it creates this catalyst that lets, it basically forces a bit of introspection at every level for individuals, but also organizations. So when things like that happen, then these bigger stakeholders do start to do stuff, um, but they're slow, you know, and if we wait for them, I don't think we're going to get there quickly enough, in my opinion. So we sort of have to agitate. Um, it, I guess it's a bit like everything I would say about, you know, being an entrepreneur, right? If you, if big comp, you know, if, if BP was doing what it should be doing, then, then Fran and her company wouldn't, wouldn't have a job to do, but you know, they obviously went off to start a company to do something quicker and better. So it's the same kind of thing. If you want change, sometimes you have to be the agent of it yourself, I think. Absolutely. That focus on pre proactivity. Um, fantastic. Well, I appreciate the time and we kind of want to move to a Q and A uh, slash networking session, but before we do so, is there any final takeaway for any, any of our panelists that want to share with the audience? Or we can just wait for Q and A. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just, I, just to underline, and Fran's already done this, but I think um, you know Rosie talked about about the platform in Chorus, and in particular this ability to sort of capture smaller events. Um, and and I just think it's a really, really powerful tool. I think you know for me one of the big frustrations in this whole area has been if you're trying to change culture in an organisation, it's really hard to capture, quantify, and sort of structure what you're trying to say and what you're trying to change. Um, anyone who's been in a difficult situation at work will will know this. You know, you you go home to your friend or your partner or whatever, and you can, you know, you vent with them and they get it and you get it. And yet somehow when you think about how am I going to say this to my boss or even my peers, it just all crumbles. And part of that is this inability to sort of really capture what's happening because a lot of these things are very small and very aggregate and I mean you know microaggression to to you know to use that and um I think so the the, the new tool that Inchorus has built around being able to capture this sort of thing that I, I you know to me it's a really really powerful indication of how we can move to sort of shift this sort of thing it's it's been a big frustration like you, you sort of know where you want to get to but getting it getting get you know having the right stuff to be able to get there is very hard and and hopefully tools like this will make a big difference so um if you feel like you're struggling with that uh, and i'm going to talk about this to some of my portfolio companies and it sounds like this is a tool to try out brilliant fantastic i'm gonna yeah <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. thank you so much well i think are there any questions we haven't got any q a at the moment are there any questions from our audience just give a moment in case anything comes through if not what we'll do is we will go into the networking mode so it means that you can kind of join tables uh, and talk to one another for the for the remainder of the the session great i think we will do that because there aren't any q a so thank you so much, Fran, Rosie and Saranga. It's been a pleasure having you today. Um, and, you know, I, I hope we'll continue this conversation um, again and, you know, keep doing the incredible things we're doing. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thanks.